Well, this episode of Word in Your Ear is supported by Packed Coffee, who very splendidly post their fragrant and exotic wares to your home address in packages that drop through the letterbox. And this top quality fare, we can assure you, from the Honduras, from Colombia, from Guatemala, is fabulously heady stuff with genuinely detectable flavours of dark chocolate and apricot and pink grapefruit and tutti frutti sweets. The farmers all paid very fairly in every cup a whole new giddy experience for old lags like us that grew up on freeze-dried granules of gold blend. <laughs> Everyone's a winner. So if you fancy taking advantage of this deal, then, and it's a cracker, go to packedcoffee.com, that's P-A-C-T coffee.com, where you can get 50% off your first and third orders and create a flexible coffee subscription by entering the code your ear at the checkout. Best your coffee ear. songs ever. That, yeah, Yoria. Be, best coffee best, songs ever, Dave? Uh, well, I mean, I was thinking about this. The, the wonderful thing about the words cup of coffee is they are, as we might say, euphonious, aren't they? They yeah. lend themselves to song. As Bob Dylan uh, discovered in that song, was it on Desire? One yeah. more cup of coffee to like go. Yeah. You, know, you, you can't make that one more cup of tea. It just doesn't work at all, no. does it? it, it, it there's the no essence. kind of... It hasn't got the essence. It doesn't sound like a complete expression, as a cup of coffee does. So that's the one I would uh, suggest off the top of my head. Have you got a better suggestion? Well, there's an EP called Songs About Coffee by oh, Might right. Be Giants, which is very, very funny. Black Coffee in Bed, I think. Heartbreak oh, by right. Squeeze. There's a stain on my notebook where your coffee cup was. And there's ash in the pages. But I think the winner actually, after some consideration, is they've got an awful lot of coffee in Brazil by Frank Sinatra. Oh, yes. Way down among the Brazilians, coffee <laughs> beans grow by the billions. So they've <laughs> got to find those extra cups to fill. A politician's daughter was accused of drinking water and find a great big $50 bill. <laughs> they've got an awful lot of coffee in Brazil. It's very good, isn't it? Oh, I love that. So what's anyway. that? What's that code again? Your ear is what your ear. I'm gonna Act make sure you put that in. Yeah, uh, full full details below. You're listening to a podcast from the Word. So this week we spoke to John Lydon for a word in your attic, word in your ear, whatever. Um, Zoom cast. We do these things via Zoom. That a couple of things, Mark, that I've um, you and I have not really discussed since uh, since recording him. One, it was a reminder of the fact that I feel that you know how well these Zoom interviews are going to go by the first glimpse you get of the person at the other end of the Zoom Absolutely. call. You you know how it is that they. Everybody must have had this experience over the last two years that you make a Zoom connection either personally or through business or whatever. And 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 the other person, first of all, appears in – well, they don't appear. You just hear them talk. Yeah, and then they're kind of in silhouette. And then there's uh, yeah. a, can you move that curtain behind you a little bit more lighting? We can't really hear – we can't really sound, uh, hear, you know, the sound isn't very good and, you yeah. But if it's the, it's that second when somebody uh, comes into vision that you very quickly – decide whether it's going to go okay. And when he came into vision, it was one, obviously the bright orange hair, clearly, uh, but more to the point, he had a bright orange top on, didn't he? A high-vis top. And he just thought, exploded onto the screens, didn't he? I thought he's making some effort here. <laughs> you know I, mean? I couldn't help thinking that. You know, The great actor has made sure he's prepared for this. This Absolutely. wasn't this wasn't just what he happened to be wearing around the house, you know what I mean? He'd gone to his no, wardrobe he was dressed up. and picked out something, you know. And uh, I think, listen, great. That's yeah, give him points for doing that, you know. And it is um, you know, it is a it is a fantastic chat. All you know, there wasn't so much chat from us, it was mainly from him, you know. Monologue from him. He's pretty he's much a self-starting mechanism, he isn't is, he? He's is is that, is that every every thought is so original and funny and slightly twisted and bitter. And I thought it was the, absolutely the dripping. second thing I was going to say to you that we have not discussed since is that he did he he did something during that Zoom conversation which still has oddly 
oddly has a greater power to shock now than he would ever have had many, many years ago, which is on two occasions, he lit a cigarette. Yes, he did. He lit a cigarette. Yeah. And there was part of me thinking, oh, my God, he's lit a cigarette. It's as yeah. if he's... It's as if he's in my house. I know, I know. I felt that the same thing. The he didn't ask permission to do that. <laughs> <laughs> didn't ask if I minded. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's it was absolutely weird. He breathed in smoke, wasn't he? Yes. You got to chain smoke throughout it, actually. It is just, I realise I just never see people smoking nowadays. You see, and that's another lockdown thing, you know, that you don't. You don't kind of go to the pubs and therefore you don't see people standing out in pub gardens or whatever, you know, smoking away like crazy. You just, I just don't see it no. at all, you know. So when somebody even does it on a Zoom call, you sort of feel that you're all you're in a shared space, don't yeah. you? We're all in the same room. I wonder why you can't smell the cigarette smoke. <laughs> it's really it's bizarre. bizarre thing. I know, I know, I know. Anyway, he talked about all kinds of things, didn't he? he? Talked about growing up in Finsbury Park. He talked about all the records he liked. Oh, t- the growing up in Finsbury Park stuff was incredible. Wasn't it? I mean, <laughs> the thing that he claimed that they had to share a loo with the pub next door. With the pub next door. So if you wanted to go and have a wee at kind of eleven o'clock at night, age seven or something, you know, you know, was, I know. Can you imagine? Oh, the, the sheer kind of. Uh, Misery of his, a lot of his childhood, and the record shops, a lovely little record shop. Talking about life. the record shop, which I too remember, there used to be a tiny record shop, which was genuinely was a hole in the wall, right opposite Finsbury Park Station, where you, you could get dub reggae. And uh, I remember that very clearly. He said and it was he, run by what he described as an old lady, <laughs> an old lady. It was selling roots rock reggae and metal. <laughs> <laughs> so brilliant. You get, you get dread standing outside, yeah, nodding, yeah, yeah. nodding their heads and so forth. Um, speaking of which, actually, slight tangent. When I was coming home from uh, uh, from from your place yesterday evening, I ended up coming through Harlesden. Uh, Harlesden on a on a on a Saturday evening, early Saturday evening, but the sun shining. And we were stuck in traffic behind a bin lorry that was emptying the bins from all the kind of Afro hairdressers in Harleston, you know what I mean? Um, and and then suddenly I realised we'd run into the loudest noise I have ever heard on a British street, which was some unseen reggae sound system. I, I honestly could not see where this noise emanated from, but it was absolutely huge sound and also really good sound. And there were a bunch of guys standing out in the street, just nodding back and forward to the, to the sound of this thing. Having a nod. And it was so loud, Bulk. I am not exaggerating one eye to when I say it set off car alarms all the way down the road. Fantastic. You can hear multiple car alarms going off just from the sheer vibration of and this it, invisible sound and system. And it needs to be loud, doesn't it? I can remember going to the Channel One uh, sound system and Talgarth Road, the carnival ones, and uh, and you stand in the middle of a kind of vortex of a triangle of huge speaker systems, and you can feel this kind of uh, physical vibration going up your spine. Fine, tingling yeah. your hair, you know, and uh, but, uh, it, it's that's the way to absorb that stuff. Uh, but uh, absolutely, yeah. but oddly enough, it's sort of not, it's not headachey, is it? No, no, not really. It's, you know, it reminded me when I was in the traffic last night. Uh, they is it Trench Town Rock by uh, Bob Marley. The opening line is one good thing about music: when it hits, you feel no pain. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and it was, that was like that. It wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. didn't attack you in the head at all. Yeah. So it was extraordinary sound. Anyway, back to John Lydon. We should mention about- that Lydon talks about the pistol. Uh, uh, oh yeah, which is absolutely. He's got so many grievances, and I can't help but thinking this is a win-win situation because obviously Lydon's job is to complain about everything. He's complaining partly because the Pistol miniseries, this is the Danny Boyle-directed miniseries that's coming out, I think, on Disney+, Plus, isn't it? Very soon, actually. There's quite a lot of press and excitement about it, um, with various actors playing the part of the, of the four or, indeed, five Pistols. I think what he's partly complaining about, it's not based on his book. It's based on Steve Jones's book. 
very yeah. good book actually, which I've read. It's really, really good. And uh, and the other thing is that he feels he has no control over the thing at all, and he's been outvoted by a majority vote, and he's got no control over the music. And I think it's perfect because John Lydon moaning about it is just the publicity they need. It's what you want. He's going to get BRS and some kind of earning from the whole project anyway. So, uh, you know, it's perfect. In fact, if, he, if John Lydon approved of it, it would sort of defeat the whole purpose, really, wouldn't it? it just you wouldn't can't have – you the whole – principle of John Lydon is you can't have him standing up at a press conference for anything yeah. and saying this is really good <laughs> you got yeah. to really enjoy this apart from <laughs> English <laughs> butter <laughs> yeah. apart, from, apart from English butter yeah. <laughs> yeah. of course the other thing with John Lydon is he's about to tour with pu- Public Image he is. Uh, which he's, he's very yeah. excited about he's talking, he's talking about all that and it's very interesting and all these early adventures, yeah, you know, buying uh, well, not Atomic Rooster records. What were I talking? Oh, I mean, his his choice of. I do recommend you 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 watch this and listen to it for his recommendation of his most disappointing album. Oh, of that's all fantastic! Time. Fantastic, <laughs> a group that I too have seen, uh, and uh, it's a really interesting choice. And it's amazing that he never thought it was going to be any good in the first place. Really, you know, it's, it's riveting. It's absolutely riveting. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So yesterday afternoon, what a convivial and wonderful occasion. Uh, You and I attended uh, a kind of memorial, a kind of send-off for an old pal of ours who died actually two years ago, but they haven't been able to do anything, obviously, because of COVID and stuff, uh, who was the producer of Old Grey Whistle Test, a guy called Mike Appleton, uh, at a fantastic, wonderful event, a big marquee in a... In a, in a in a in a field in a meadow in Cobham in Surrey, surrounded no, by blossoms. It struck me that there's no word for it, is there? Really, you know, my kids were saying, "So what was it? Was it a service?" I said, "No, it's not a service. Was it a party? No, it's not really a party. No, no it's just a kind of gathering. A memorial know. sounds yeah. too kind of down because it, it consists of." Right. You know, I suppose six, seven, eight people, his grandchildren, uh, Bob Harris, uh, us, um, Mike Reed, various people, his brother, his, his wife, you know, making kind of, well, they like said eulogies, just talking about it, but it's fond memories, you know. And then a band came, an 11 piece band playing Mustang Sally. And <laughs> obviously. Stand obviously. By wedding band, really, weren't they, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and who started, interestingly, of course, with Stone Fox Chase. Of course. By, by Area Code 615. On the harmonica, which is... Uh, can, can, I, can I just say something about Stone Fox Chase? You know, when I first learned the name of that thing, that tune, I always thought it was something rural. I thought it was something about actually pursuing a fox. A la the hunt through through the through the trees, rather than the pursuit of a really uh, a really attractive young woman. It was only you know the, the expression. That. Well, you've only really just I didn't thought know what it was about, but that's right. So, it's taken you so even a stone longer. Fox, a stone fox, well, a, a st- girl. Absolutely, oh, it's no. chick in the parlance chick. or whatever. An you old lady. You yeah. <laughs> no, not an old lady. Not an old lady. Old lady, you know, kind of wore a gingham frock and was, uh, you know, yeah, there was actually was your girlfriend. House. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas the stone fox was some kind of eye-catching young floozy yeah. in a bar somewhere. Yeah, know? yeah. So anyway, Stone Fox Chase, that's uh, that's a journey I undertook from thinking it was all about oh, foxes right. to it was all about girls. Anyway, carry on. Yes, no, they no. did start with it. And, uh, they did. Anyway. And, they, and we all made little speeches. And you and I talked about meeting Mike and how, you know, the job offer really had changed our lives and what an extraordinary guy he was. And it struck me when, when Bob was talking, I thought, God, times have changed. Bob was talking about... 1972, wasn't he, when he joined the programme? Yeah. And now, if you're in that kind of A&R world and you're trying to find new bands, you're just ploughing through, um, you know, tracks on Spotify or whatever, then you were kind of pioneers, you know, and you would go out to Los Angeles for three weeks and you would uh, set up camp and you'd go out and look for exciting new local musicians. And you'd, at one point, Bob said he'd rung back and he said he'd seen somebody called Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Do you remember that? Mm. And Mike said, I'll fly out tomorrow. You know, yes. they went out, they took out, hired a camera crew and they go, oh, look, Alice Cooper, he sounds interesting. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jackson Brown, what's that all about? You know? 
And it was just, yeah, it was like kind of pioneers going out, gold diggers going out. And, uh, now, more than one person making a, a speech about Mike referred to Mike's very characteristic uh, sartorial style, shall we call it this? Yeah. You know, Mike, Mike was, you know, he was a bit older on than I was. He was born before the war, you know. And, um, and so he had a great kind of formality in his dress, which is somehow sort of adapted to the kind of music business milieu in which he <laughs> lived, breathed and had his being. And, uh, and so, you know, if you, if you're familiar with the, with the style of clothing adopted by the manager of Spinal Tap in the movie, you'll be familiar with what Mike used to wear, which is very often he would wear a tour jacket yep. over over a shirt, a collar and tie. And he always used to wear a striped shirt with a white collar and a very thin tie and, and comfy shoes and quite often b- bright red kickers. Kickers? kickers? One of his, grand- one of his, grand- one of his grandchildren would actually refer to that in her uh, in her remarks, the granddad's red kickers. Those red shoes. <laughs> That's fantastic. But anyway, but it's funny. I was, jacket. I was thinking about tour jackets because his brother, who was quite significantly younger than Mike, also spoke. And he actually was spoke while wearing one of old Mike's uh, Mike's old teeth. Yeah, especially uh, made it had bat on the he- bat out of hell on the back, didn't it? And his own name monogrammed on the front. It was brilliant. I was talking about bat out of hell. To be fair, Mike Appleton made bat out of hell because they'd put out, you know, they they had it coming out of the states. They weren't bothered about it at all in the states. And he was somehow, I can't remember, somebody was telling me a story not long ago um, that the Mike was the person who saw the, the, the video uh, of that out of hell and played the whole thing on Whistler. Because if Mike wanted something, he just put it on. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, Bat Out of Hell made it in the UK first, and it made it purely on the back of that first exposure on, on Whistle Test, and then went back and made a huge hid in the United States as well. But, uh, yeah, the well, tour got, jackets. He got accused, didn't he, of, sort of having a, you know, people criticise his sort of mainstream taste and all that. But, you know, without him, that little feet and Ry Cooda and, you know, uh, oh, well, the, yeah, the, 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 Tim Buckley, John Martin, all those people. That he, and the, I mean, he, he was the first person to put those people on the telly. No, yeah, definitely. A huge effect. No, I mean, but boy, he had an extensive wardrobe of tour jackets. So, so, <laughs> so he really did. I was thinking, I, I was, thinking, I was trying to remember last night, or you know, the, the glory days of the uh, tour jacket. And I hold it here in my hand, a copy of "This Time It's for Real" by Southside Johnny and the Asbury Dukes. And uh, you know, if you've got it, you'll be familiar with the fact that all, all the man on the front are wearing satin tour jackets. There they are. I'm holding it up for you, Mark. And on the back, you've got the tour jacket itself. I cannot tell you how covetable tour jackets were. They were gorgeous. Back in the 1970s. Collarless. Yes. They look really good. Collarless with little zips at the front. And, well, they uh, were baseball shiny. jackets. They were baseball jackets. That's yeah, they were. what yeah. they were. It was supposed to make you look like a member of a team. But you couldn't buy them back in those days no. for love nor money. The only way you could get them is if you were uh, yeah, either in the band or somebody senior in the media that the, 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 uh, the band record company wished to curry favour with. So let me tell you, Mike had a whole wardrobe. Yeah, an entire wardrobe. Jacket. It should be in the V&A now. It really it? Alongside David Bowie's stage outfits. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the Beatles' Nero coloured jackets. I know, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. They ought, to, they ought to be donated to the nation. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. Today... Um, Slightly gloomily, actually, is, is almost the uh, exactly the back, uh, the the anniversary, the fiftieth anniversary of the death of Les Harvey of Stone the Cruise. Wow. Do you remember that? And I can remember. I was whatever well, I was, just eighteen, I think. And I can remember that because very significant event. Les Harvey died on stage during a show uh, in Swansea. Oh, right, okay. Swansea, I think it was. Yeah, yeah okay. in front of a thousand people, or was electrocuted on so he had a faulty microphone, or whatever. I can remember because I was in various little teenage bands, and you became very, very conscious of the fact that. You know, th- this was this going to happen again to anybody? I mean, you know, the idea that you touched a faulty microphone that you would die 
seemed absolutely extraordinary. And uh, you know, so wasn't it? Wasn't he Alex Harvey's brother? Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Stone the Crows, uh, kind of forgotten now, really, yeah. but very much fancied to happen at the time, weren't they? The Maggie Bell was they the were. Uh, lead singer. And Jimmy McCulloch was in Stone yeah, the Crows. Yeah, they broke up they? very soon after the thing. I yeah. broken by yeah. the whole thing. I mean, that's just yeah. a terrible thing. And it, it, was just... a, it was at the top rank, wasn't it? It was, <laughs> why do I remember these things? Yeah. The top rank ballroom in where did you say is Swansea? I think it's Swansea. Swansea. Yeah. And um, yeah, of course, one of the not the only musician to die on stage. Well, I was just looking at that and uh, I I just, you would never forget a performance where the person you paid to see suddenly expired in front of you. But I mean, my God, there's been quite a few. Nelson Eddy died on stage in 1967 really yeah yeah oh, 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 brain hemorrhage playing in a hotel in miami beach in florida tiny tim and i've forgotten this tiny tim in 1996 was playing a, a, a gala benefit at the women's club of minneapolis <laughs> and had a had a had a heart attack we shouldn't be laughing right in the middle of tiptoe through the tulips so there you go. I know. You're still stuck at the uh, the gala benefit for the Women's Club of Minneapolis. <laughs> I know. It's extraordinary. I'm sorry, no disrespect to anybody at all, but, you know, there's no scriptwriter who can make that up. No. That's absolutely can you follow right. that with the phrase, it's the way you would have liked it? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not. Johnny Guitar Watson. Johnny Guitar Watson collapsed and died at a blues club. Uh, outside of Tokyo. I mean, Dimebag Daryl, that's a little dreadful mm, story, wasn't it? The mm. guy from Damage Plan. He was actually performing at a, a, a club in, in Columbus, Ohio, and somebody ran on stage and, and, and shot him with a Beretta rifle, an automatic oh. pistol, you know. So that's pretty grim. But Jackie Wilson's a sad old story, wasn't it? Jackie Wilson. Actually, before we go to Jackie Wilson, when we were talking about the other week, um, Chris Rock being attacked by yeah. by um, by uh, Will Smith uh, at the Oscars. I said this will not be the final case of somebody feeling that they can go on stage and assault a comedian. And you're right. What, what happened the other day with Dave Chappelle was was doing a show, wasn't he? Yeah. And some guy, some Somebody guy rushed him. <laughs> well, the I mean, you know, how are you to know that the guy doesn't have a knife or a gun absolutely, or whatever, absolutely. you know? And um, you know, because comics, particularly comics, you can't have them protected by a wall of muscle, can no. you? It just doesn't work. You no, know? it doesn't. If you've got a comedian supposed to be creating some kind of community with the with the audience, you can't have you know, people in between. And also, you don't expect people through overexcitement to suddenly kind of no. lose it and want to kind of invade the stage. Yeah. What are they invading? Just a, a lone figure at a microphone. It doesn't yeah, make sense, yeah. you know. So, yes, Jackie Wilson. I mean, Jackie Wilson, extraordinary. He, um, you know, in September 1975, he was on stage in uh, at a casino in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, doing his greatest hits. He was doing Lonely Teardrops, uh, as we know. And uh, he collapsed on stage. And, of course, given the kind of long and rich tradition, and particularly R&B acts, of, uh, of people pretending to Yeah, the James Brown stage. tradition of pegging James out Brown. and being resuscitated, you know. <laughs> A lot of people just assume this is part of the act, which you kind of probably would, wouldn't you? Yeah, you would. You know what I mean? Um, and of course it wasn't, and he uh, he'd, uh, he'd, uh, he'd had he, a heart, he, heart attack uh, 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 while singing the words "My heart is crying." Oh yeah, it's yeah. extraordinary, isn't it? But the amazing thing is that he he went lapsed into a coma. So this is 1976, and um, and he didn't actually die until 1984. So during that long period of time people were still putting out his old records and <laughs> so forth yeah. and uh, and you know the old one was becoming a hit you know because he had the kind of catalogue lonely teardrops and uh you know and then with the the kind of mentions of covid roland and so forth you know his name was always about 
And people say, Is he isn't he dead? And no, he wasn't strictly dead. He was eight years in a coma. No, no, terrible. Didn't die until 1984. I know. Still. The other the other person that I, I I thought about this okay we're now going into the into the realms of fiction obviously although in real life he did die of course was the drummer of Spinal Tap Rick Parnell <laughs> uh, Rick Parnell died about a week ago and uh, it just reminded me that the whole gag about the drummer of Spinal Tap was that drummers were the first they led these they were chaotic outrageous <laughs> characters who who were the first to die uh, in, in in bands and you know with John Bonham and, and Keith Moon and Keith Dennis Moon, Wilson yes. I suppose recently Taylor Hawkins yeah. there is some kind of truth in that oh, they were God, the kind of never the thought big, of that yeah. big liability characters you know because the first drummer of Spinal Tap died in a bizarre gardening accident and then there was somebody choked on somebody else's vomit and then, and then uh, and the Rick Parnell character died I think just spontaneously combusted and what was interesting I thought was that I was just reading an obituary about him was that um, that was simultaneously being in Spinal Tap simultaneously the making and the, and the breaking of him you know because it was a great opportunity and actually you know the, the, the band did actually form and they played various concerts and he was the drummer when they played they did a little UK tour and all that stuff well they played Albert Hall and stuff but also simultaneously uh, it, it kind of ruined and reduced his chances of getting employment as a real drummer yeah because his association with Spinal Tap made it look like if you had him in the band, it was somehow just lampooning the whole thing. Is concept he, is he playing were. joke drums? Yeah. He's playing joke drums, I know, because he had an audition for White Snake. And then I think David Coverdale discovered that he'd been in Spinal Tap and it was immediately cancelled. Yeah. It was a big See, thing about. I'm sorry, Mark, you would. Yeah, you, you would. No, you, you just would. would. Yeah, you know, Bruce Dickinson you made lots of very public announcements about how much he loathed this film and loathed this guy. They'd, they'd somehow just kind of just completely <laughs> taken the piss out of the whole world that these people <laughs> operated in. You could really understand it, you know. So, so the thing that surprised me about, I didn't know, really know anything about him at all, but I read the air bits when he died. Yeah. He's the son of Jack Parnell. Yeah. He was a dance band drummer of some repute and obviously part of the, part of the Parnell Delphont grade show business family people who ran ran entertainment in britain in the in the 50s and 60s so i think his uncle was val parnell yeah who did it it was val parnell sunday night at the london palladium you know so he was he was showbiz royalty you know yeah. but uh instead of um Instead of uh, taking up the drums in the in the kind of London Palladium pit band, he ended up playing drums with a uh, atomic, atomic rooster. rooster. Like, <laughs> atomic rooster, and then did lots of sessions. I mean, he was a big pal of Mitch Mitchell's, wasn't he? he did lots of sessions, all sorts of weird albums, Bette Midler and things, you know. But he also he, kind of he's British, and then kind of moved to America and became kind of moved, became American and became an American citizen. He, he lived his latter part of his life in Missoula, Montana. You see, and it is my theory, Mark, that if you go to most small towns in America, um, and if you stay there long enough, you will discover somewhere in the town is a former member of Budgie or Pete <laughs> Brown's Pattern Ornaments or whatever, who's just got left, be Americans wearing left a behind by some tour. You know what I mean? Very often married an American girl. Yeah, yeah, yes, stayed there and stayed there because they kind of couldn't face coming back, and they and they got used to it, and they got used to the telly yeah. and so forth. And uh, but what he didn't do, um, which also interests me, is he he never changes changed his nationality. And I'm going to put to you my theory, which I've just I've just coined in the last week which is actors change their nationality to American. Musicians don't. And even though musicians spend a lot of their time in America and make a lot of money out of America, they rarely change nationality. Whereas actors are doing it all the time. Anthony Hopkins became an American citizen. Emily Blunt became an American citizen. Craig McDermott became an American citizen. Loads and loads of these people do Is that it. because you're not particularly as bothered about the identity of actors because they're constantly playing other people? I think there characters. are probably... Whereas, whereas with musicians, because part of your integrity is the it way is. you come from. I suppose it is. Yeah. I suppose it is. Yeah, you are yourself, aren't you? Yeah. You know? And then there must be tax advantages to doing it. There must be reasons why all yeah, these yeah. actors have done it. But you know, the Beatles never did it. No. And when you and that and, and yet they they all, am I right in saying no, four out of uh, three out of four married Americans. 
Yes. They all married foreigners, didn't they, at one stage? Three out of all married Americans. Yeah. And uh, and the Rolling Stones, you know, became American in 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 every sense except their nationality. Never changed yeah. that at all. Yeah. Led Zeppelin never changed it. Um, I just think it's interesting. I, I I I await the world's explanation. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink, and it's like being in the pub. I should just mention at this point, um, if you haven't already got your tickets for June the eighteenth. In Holland Park, when we are marking the 80th birthday of James Paul McCartney, in excellent company, we're going to have a number of people talking about him, paying tribute to him. Uh, We've already announced uh, the great Andy Miller and Jeff Lloyd are going to be joining us, uh, but there are more to come very soon. So make sure you've got your tickets. Three more terrific speakers about to be in there. Yeah, Yeah, and we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, full details of how you can do that will be somewhere associated with this podcast underneath or whatever. You know how to do it, don't you? Anyway, what else have we been doing in the last few days? We talked well, to, we talked talk to uh, Tom Cox, yeah, who I thought was really good for, for a word in your attic about his record collection. Tom Cox is a, a former music critic of the, on the Enemy and The Guardian and became a novelist, now lives in, in, in the heart of, uh, of rural Dartmoor and uh, posts pictures of fantastic countryside every day. And he's just a really interesting guy, I think, and, and an obsessive record collection. And he posted this thing about, about his record collection, about how it's now so huge that he uh, operates a, 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 a one-in, one-out policy. He yeah. only buy a record if you can get rid of another one, uh, because he can't you know, accommodate any more records. And, uh, and he also talked about it being a kind of, in a very, he said, a pleasant illness. I thought it was quite an interesting idea that re- that kind of obsessive record collection is, is a, a, it's a, almost an affliction. He cannot go past a charity shop without going in, because if you, if you don't go in, you might miss that, you know, original pressing of the Trees album or, uh, you know, Odyssey and Oracle by the Zombies or something, you know, and you you just, you can't bear the idea that you're going to miss out. And he's also, well, yeah. he's not a completist. So he didn't approve of Record Store Day. He didn't think, I've got to have everything made by this particular act. It's a different kind of obsession, just rare records, you know. I was intrigued by this um, because I I've got a lot of records. And I know a fair amount about, about records, but what you realise is you don't know as much as you think you do, you know. And um, and he's he's in his forties, isn't he? Tom? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, he's a mere child when it comes to this kind of thing, and yet he was, um, you know, revealing records from the late sixties, early seventies. That I've literally never heard of. Well, there's one group, uh, neither of us have heard of, called Morning. They're called British, Morning. British I ne- group, no, no, they're not British. I don't think they're British. No, they're, sorry, they're American. That's right. They're American. And he said that they were very much in the kind of tradition of the band, I think he said. And um, I had never seen it. I'd never heard of it, which is remarkable when you consider that. You know, every day when when that record came out, I was going into record shops yeah. and looking at the new releases and never saw it, never heard of it. And he bought it and he said, really good. And most of the point of what amazed me is that he's subsequently so assiduous is his record collecting nowadays that he had bumped into multiple copies of this record 50 years later, Mark you, okay? Yeah. And had bought and everyone in order and to And bought a, everyone a to home. give to friends. And these are records that I think he said they were quite reasonable. They're about 30 quid. Well, I, 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 I don't think I've ever paid 30 quid for a record. You know what I mean? But that's that's new age record collecting, isn't it? You know, it is. that's what you do. And uh, And I was just amazed that this record which they probably only pressed a few hundred copies of all those years ago. And most of them will have found their way into landfill or, you know, many, many years ago. Yeah. But there is still sufficient out there for him to find a few. And he hasn't found them via the internet. He's found them by just going to record fairs or second-hand shops or whatever and going through the... 
going through the ranks and eventually stumbling upon them. Now, this cannot go on because this stuff is just going to disappear, isn't it? Because it's a finite he, he, amount of it. It's a finite amount of it. And this is what he was talking about. He said a lot of his interest in record collecting is it, well, he likes collecting lots of things, doesn't he? He likes collecting old uh, china, I think he said, or oh, whatever. Oh, yeah. Old, old objets yeah and so the records are they're a category of objet darts aren't they really yeah. that's very much the way he kind of looks on i mean he appreciates the music as well but he just likes the idea of oh there's this old thing and it's 50 60 years old and, and feel it and look at it and get close to it and smell it yeah he so, talked about the tactile experience yeah it's so true and uh i just thought it, 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 this must be the kind of last go round for this kind of original artifact thing. So the record collectors of the future will be yelping with delight and joy when they find a copy of a Paul Weller record that was put out for Record Store Day in 2015 or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. They got, that will be the new definition of rarity, won't it? It'll, it will, be, ma- it'll be manufactured rarity yeah. will be the next thing that yeah. people get excited about. But it's also that connection between, there's something very attractive about the idea that, that these records come out at the time, and he talked about one called uh, Dreaming with Alice by Mark Fry, a kind of a psychedelic yeah. folk rock album. And, uh, you know, the idea when those things came out, they were completely ignored. Nobody, nobody was no. even aware of them. And now uh, quite a large number of people are incredibly knowledgeable about them and obsessed by them. And I rather like that, you know, and, and there is that connection between, you know, how few of those things existed, whether or not it's very hard to quantify whether they're actually any good because what their, their, their value is based on their obscurity really, isn't it? Yeah. Now, you know, I've been saying that, you know, CDs are due for a bit of a comeback. <laughs> I've been, I've been, you know, playing a lonely tune on this uh, for a while. Yeah, yeah. But but the other the other week, I spoke to uh, the guy who's the senior mastering engineer at Abbey Road, and he sits there in his splendid mastering suite at the at the top of at the top of Abbey Road, and he's got all the kit he needs to do it for for online and and so forth. And he's got, also got the lathe, so he can he can do the record or whatever. And what he told me was that is that nowadays it's no by no means certain that they'll even bother to master it for CD, but they will always they will always master it for record because because there's a market, yeah, you know, to buy a vinyl record of just about anybody. And of course, if you're kind of a hipster indie act or a dance act or whatever, you've got to have the vinyl. So the vinyl's getting done as a matter of course. How many are manufactured or not, I do not know. It's getting done as a matter of course. The CD is no longer getting done as a matter of course. It will be done sometimes, but it won't be done all the time. This must make, Mark, CDs rarer. It's got to. It's just got to. So, so in 20 in years, years' time, well, if, there even, if there is if there is the hardware the, to play them, <laughs> there, and there will be the hardware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there will be definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, I, this is going to, you know, finding a, you know, finding finding a record from 2020 on CD will be, you know, will be a feeling of some excitement. It will if you find it at some point in the future. So hang on to your CDs, kids. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. (laughs) 